something like ridiculously uh, overproductive while you're dealing with a crisis situation. Um, and it's not really that easy. Um, your brain is a very unique organ that loves to take care of you, put you in protection mode at all times, uh, and can also distort reality for you as well. So it's, it's a tricky little devil, but super, super uh, special and important. Um, so uh, don't know if I was just able to pin my video. Hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, so I wanted to talk about goal setting, habits, how it applies to health and wellness today. Um, so if everybody has like a piece of paper um, and some pen, we're gonna do a little workshopping to begin with. Um, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. Do you mind? Um, sorry, I know I made you the host and shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I wrote, like should have waited for that, but Alex, can you make it so I can share my screen? I've got a couple of slides that we can go over. It should be just down at the bottom. Yeah, perfect. All right. Do, do, do. Okay. So title of class is old habits don't have to, but to die hard. That is, it's generally a common saying that have, old habits do die hard, but I don't think that's necessarily the case that it has to be. Um, there's a sweet science that is behind habits um, being, and being able to achieve your goals. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. So objectives of the course, um, always recognizing that this is a very unique situation that we're, we're all in right now. Um, we are in, still in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, a lot of us are still quarantining. A lot of us are attempting to establish a new normal um, back at work, which is really hard. Um, and we're also in the middle of a very overdue social movement. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different factors that are going on, a lot of different stressors. So this is for informative purposes and something that you can put in your toolbox to be able to take with you and, and move forward. Um, yeah, we're going to understand SMART goals. So uh, on the next slide, I'm going to give you like a little task that we can work on for a few minutes to go over habits, SMART goals, um, and seeing if we can build a process to let ourselves get to a, 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 an achievable um, directive by the end of our course. Um, the next thing we'll do is understand the complexity of our behaviors. This is where discussion of the brain comes into play um, and discuss the process of implementing habit change. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, usually I have this Fresh Prince of Bel-Air slide in here for an agreements thing. The other part I like to, to make sure that people understand in this class um, this class is being recorded so my information can be passed along and people can see that again. You are more than welcome to have your video off. You are welcome to change your name. You are welcome to just listen. You're welcome to not participate. It's totally fine. I want this to be a safe environment for everybody to be able to learn uh, and feel heard. Anything that gets discussed in here, you can always tell people what you heard from me, but I prefer and would ask that nobody shares what other people um, talk about in here. If you all want to discuss with each other outside of this um, environment, that's totally fine, but please don't share with whatever anybody else discuss, discusses in this class with other people who are not involved today. Uh, that's just my, my basis for safety here. So going on to more fun stuff. So I want everybody to take a couple minutes here um, and we're going to work on two different things. First, I want you to write down three to five things that you do on a regular basis. And if you have more than those three to five, that's fine. And if you can only come up with three, that's fine. If you can come up with one, I'm happy. Um, these are your daily decisions, habits, what you think might be a habit, um, anything like that. So that's part one. Part two, I want you to think about, uh, and this is very much no pressure, we're going to talk about SMART goals. So SMART goals are something that people use in project management all the time, but it really does work when we're trying to do behavioral changes for ourselves. SMART means that the goal is specific, measurable, attainable, and achievable. That's kind of an interchange one. Uh, relative and realistic. I'm sorry, I didn't put that achievable, attainable thing down there. So achievable slash attainable, is it something like, can we really do this? Um, and is it also like, does it make sense for me? Relative or realistic? So is it, is it relevant to what I want to do? Like most of us in this are, most of us in this group are going to be hospitality professionals. Does it apply to what I'm doing right now? Is it me trying to become like a fashion designer? Am I going for a career change? Or am I trying to like set this goal that like does apply to me or doesn't apply to me? So that's what we're thinking about for the realistic. And then time bound. 
So we want to have a concrete understanding of how we can get this done. We need to have a deadline. It's not that it just could get done at some point in time. We have, we have an actual time, right? So a simple goal that I could set um, would be, and this is something I, I already did, I set this for myself a while ago, was the goal is to get myself into therapy. I want to keep working on my mental health, so I want to get into therapy. So specifically, set real numbers and deadlines. Don't just say, I want to get into therapy. I want to get into therapy by October 1st, because I know it's hard to get appointments for these kind of things, so you might have to set a little bit higher, uh, longer, longer uh, duration for something like that, like mental health. So I want to see a therapist. I want to find a therapist by October 1st. How is my goal trackable? Being able to actually find a person and establish an appointment would be a measurable thing that I can do with that. Is this attainable? Absolutely. It's working towards a goal of where I want to get my mental health in check and be with somebody on a consistent basis that they can help me out with this process. Is it realistic or relative? Being honest with yourself, do you know what you and your, my team is me, because again, this comes from project management stuff. Am I capable of this? Yes, I absolutely can find this. Um, even if I don't have health insurance, uh, between everything that Alex and Lauren are doing with Focus on Health, with what I'm doing, there's a bunch of groups that have put together a laundry list of slide and scale or pro bono um, therapists that are available to work with you in these different capacities. Um, so yes, all of this does exist. There are resources for me. This is realistic. This is relative to my goals of getting into a better mental health space. Time bound. I said I'm gonna do it by October 1st. So I have given myself a deadline. I don't want to go past that, right? So that's, that's one example. Think about any kind of goal you'd like to set for yourself, one to three, and I want you to take time to really do the specific, measurable, achievable, relative, realistic, and time bound uh, portions of it. Do one goal if it's a little too much for you to do that. Um, or I'm gonna see if I can put this on a split screen so we can see a little bit more of people. No, I can't. I might stop sharing just so I can see. But please, everybody take a couple minutes. We'll give you like five minutes or so to work on just a list of what are some of the things that you think are habits or behaviors that you do on a regular basis, decisions that you make, um, and then try to give me at least one um, of a SMART goal. It could be related to health and wellness. It doesn't have to be at all. Oh no, what have I done? Too much. Amy, I was gonna ask um, the, the habits and decisions, are those like necessarily positive or negative or neutral or? Anything in between. I'm, I'm content with you putting something that you might think is a great thing that you do or a thing that you, Maybe it's a thing that you would eventually like to change. Maybe it's a not so great thing. So, I mean, this is an awesome opportunity for if anybody is considering like toning down drinking, that is a way that you could talk about that. That's a habit that I have. When I have a frustrating day, I go out and have a drink after I'm done. Obviously things are very different right now because of the whole situation that we're in, but good, bad, neutral, everything in between, everything is fair fodder here. Excellent question. Always try to adjust my little panel so I can still try to see people in here. <laughs> Let me see. I'll stop sharing for a hot moment. I'll put on like a little tune for everybody. How about that? I had run the Jules radio on yesterday and I've been going with that, so. <laughs> Run the jewels. We'll entertain everybody here. <laughs> oh, there's an entire like Hello Kitty remix of I'll Run the Jewels. Did you all know that? It's very exciting. <laughs> Sorry. 
we'll all be entertained by Roman Jules for a hot second while everybody works on their <laughs> goal setting. And if you ever want to, if you're done already, and you want me to stop playing music and just continue on, do your little raise the hand thing on your, uh, on your Zooms. I know, I think I'm very entertaining. It's not all like this. Cool. Looking for names like I lost a friend. Jump out of my bed like when I bread. You go hold the egg. Waiter, bring the check. When we talk, we come in the car. Keep us in your thoughts. We'll be dressed at the crack of dawn. But this heading off, I can hear them from the block. See them creeping through the floor. This is pretty stuff. Feeding season can start. Oh my God. Look alive. Looking like I left life on a crooked line. Do it fly. You want maximum stupid. I ain't the guy. First of all, fuck the fucking law. We is going to fall. Six o'clock. What's this on the hand? Say I'll switch it ball. Like a bitch. And the bitch and bitch. I was very supercharged after everything that's happened this week in the last couple of months. I feel very jazzed up by the newest run of jewels and all of them because they're like the contemporary rage against the machine. And I love it. It makes my heart happy. just finish out the song. There's 20 seconds left. Um, and if anybody, if anyone's comfortable sharing, do let me know. Um, and you're more than welcome to talk about some of those things. If you are not comfortable sharing, then we can just go right back into our lecture. Um, totally fine. Um, just want to give an opportunity if anybody has any follow-up questions as to, as to that. All right, so we just finished our activity. I asked everybody to write down a couple things like habits that you do on a regular basis or decisions that you make on a regular basis in addition to uh, a goal that you have for yourself. Doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be wellness related. Even, you know, I know we're doing a wellness uh, discussion, but, but like, could be anything. Does anybody feel comfortable sharing? If not, that's all right. Um, you can just sit on that list and kind of marinate as we discuss a few more things. Sound good? I don't mind sharing. Okay, go for it. Um, for my habits, I wrote um, that I like take my dog on longer walks. Like I've started taking her on a lot longer walks. Um, I under eat um, and then I work out, but just not consistently. Mm -hmm. um, and then for goals, I wrote that I'd like to work out five days a week consistently by October. Um, that I'd like to continue packing lunch and dinner for myself for work um, and that I'd like to learn to meal prep because right now I don't do like a, a meal prep kind of pack lunch. It's more like just like a sandwich. Okay, cool. Thank you for sharing that, Alex. Does anybody else feel comfortable sharing or? I could share. Go for it, Drew. Uh, so the regular things are I cook, I work out, I play video games, I clean my apartment. Um, the SMART goals would be reduce monthly expenses by 200 per month in one month, increase earnings by 200 per month in one month, and go on one day in one month. I love all of these things. Um, so thank you both for sharing those. Um, what you have in terms of your list of behaviors are 
perfect, that's fine. There's like no, I know you asked about good, bad, neutral, anything in between. Habits are habits, behaviors are behaviors. So we're gonna kind of dissect those. In terms of our SMART goals, everybody had some pretty good concrete ones, but the purpose of the SMART goal is to kind of give yourself more of an action plan as to how you're going to achieve that. So Drew, how would you be able to decrease your expenses? Have you thought about where those $200 can come from? Where are they on the list? Like, is it, I will buy one less video game per month, or I will be able to change how much energy I'm expending in my apartment. So when we think about goal setting, the reason why they become a little bit more difficult to achieve is because we don't pick it apart enough to really see the action items that we can check off as we're going along. And it's not, that's not like a, a criticism. It's just the way that our brain needs to think about it a little bit more. And same thing for Alex, like working out five days a week is a fucking awesome idea. Do you have a gym? Do you have the resources? Is it going to be at home? Is it going to be outside of home? Think a little bit more in terms of like, what does those five, what do those five days look like? Are they here? Are they in a gym setting? Um, what kind of workout do you want to do? Uh, are you trying to increase your like cardiorespiratory capacity so you can, you know, shout across your bar with that mask on and do so safely? Or are you trying to like build up the strength in your legs so those 12 hour shifts are a lot easier to achieve? So everybody has like a great idea and a good basis for goals, but there's always like a little extra level of detail that we can put into them so we can have a little bit more accountability, but also see the light at the end of everything. Um, Thank you again, both of you for sharing those. Um, with everybody else, I, I want you to like, I, I want everybody to just kind of hold on to these lists and look at their goals. And we're gonna go through a couple more things on our slides. Um, let me do, 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 do. Share, share, share my screen. Okay, all right. So we talked about, we went through our SMART goals. Um, we can come back to these and and like see how everybody's feeling about them at the end of this discussion. See if there's something you might want to change or something you might want to add in to help yourself along. Um, when it comes to, because we were talking a little bit about wellness uh, and movement and the habits that are associated with that, our relationship with both of those things, food, movement, and everything in between is incredibly complicated. Um, they come from, the, it, it starts from when you're a child. Um, so if you've ever this is mainly just to tell you that if you've ever had any difficulty trying to change a behavior, especially in terms of eating, like eating more than anything else is one of the most complex things that we ever have to deal with. It's a learned behavior that's incredibly complex that is steeped in cultural upbringing, beliefs from your parents, everything handed down to you. So it is really, really difficult in order to be able to change those things. So if you've ever felt that you've hit these massive roadblocks, whenever you were just trying to even think about, I want to... I want to cook on a regular basis, or I want to make meals that I can take into work. All of those have such emotional uh, connections to them that they can be just very draining on us, which is why it's hard to upkeep those particular things. Um, and because they're so mood driven, that can impact a lot of things as well. However, they are modifiable, and that's where that habit loop does come into play. So here's the basis of the habit loop. Everybody has these things happening in our brain all the time. Habit loops govern our automated response to every bit of stimuli that's in our world. Uh, and we complete them without thought. So it's anywhere from like 45 to 55% of the actions that we take every single day are actually habits. Decisions that we make, behaviors that we have, they're habits. And that's because our brain is a sneaky little devil and loves to put everything in like nice, neat, orderly fashion so you can move and act efficiently without having to exert any kind of brain space. Like we know so little about the brain. We know it's this amazing thing. We also know that it's very sly. It wants to conserve energy at all times, which is why it ends up going into these automated habit things. So half the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not even thinking about. And that's because your brain has taken over and turned it into a habit that just responds to a couple different things. Um, your brain knows what that cue is, and then it knows what the reward will be. So it has you do a specific behavior or routine that, that it likes, that it's used to, and that it wants to keep doing in order to like not have to think about it. 
So breaking down those, those three things, the cue, the routine, the reward, and sometimes like on a couple of these slides, you'll see the cue say trigger, and it's a kind of, it's a pretty problematic word. Um, so I try to go with cue, um, and routine can be interchanged with behavior, habit, whatever it might be. So just think about how we have multiple ways in which we can dialogue this particular thing. So the cue is what actually brings about the habitual behavior. This can be anything from the time of the day, being hungry, being stressed out, um, or being with particular people. Like, I think we can all probably turn back in our brain a little bit and understand like certain people that we hang out with that we always tend to do X, Y, Z behavior. Um, so good behaviors, bad behaviors, anything in between, but there are people that we're like instantaneously feel this connection with and we do these things together all the time. So can be anything. The routine itself is the habit, the behavior, the action that you're performing. And the reward is the pleasurable response from doing that action. Um, this can be both physical stimulation, so something like caffeine, what caffeine gives you, um, or a positive feeling. Um, as the loop continues to repeat, the habit becomes more ingrained in your brain. Um, and this is where most petite people tend to falter if they're changing a habit, um, is that it's really hard to break or change those things because they're so automated. And this is why, like, we're going to talk about this towards the end, keystone habits. It's being able to build small little changes that have a positive snowball effect towards being able to, like, make some kind of difference in your life, wh whatever habit it might be. So just to go through a couple of uh, examples of what, what habit loops look like, phones are an example, right? So my phone's right here. It's probably a silly idea to have that here while I'm in the middle of a presentation because I know that that is something if a light goes off, I'm going to look at it. The physical sensation of the light going off is a reason for me to look at it. The buzzing of the phone is a reason for me to look at it. So all of those are cues that would cause me, and the, just the sheer presence of it being in my face is a, is a cue, is a reason why I would want to, what is the behavior? I look at the phone, I pick up the phone, I check my messages, I check my email, whatever it might be. I check Instagram. Uh, the reward is that I get some kind of distraction or instant gratification by picking up that phone, right? So um, that's a really simple one that we probably all are super, super familiar with. And it could be your phone, it could be your uh, iPad, it could be whatever. So there's different things that, that would stimulate that automatic, like I'm going to look at, pick up, try to get some quick reward out of it. Another one is coffee. I love coffee, I love tea, I love all these things. Coffee is delicious. Um, there's so many reasons for loving coffee, right? Just drink some water to balance it out. So the routine or the behavior is the actual drinking of the coffee. So what is the cue? And again, this is one of those slides that does have trigger as a reward. I should just like make my own slides when talking about how to lose. Um, so what is the trigger? It could be that uh, I'm really tired or it's seven o'clock in the morning or it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon if you're a bartender, whatever. So the cue could be that it is the particular time of day. It could be that is I just woke up, this is what I do. Or it could be like, I'm, I'm tired. Whatever it might be, the behavior is drinking the coffee. The reward is that I am perky, happy. I can't start anything until I get my coffee in me, right? Heard that a million times, I'm sure. So this can also be, is this the same one? So uh, this can also be the same thing as like candy. So why do we eat candy? I like the sugary food. It tastes good. Hello kitty over there. Uh, we think that we have like these cravings for candy or, or salty foods, sweet foods, whatever. I, I'm definitely like a salty person. Like I always, my mouth starts to water when I talk about salt because I know that I get that awesome gratification of like a pretzel. Like when I have that and like how it makes my saliva just go crazy, right? So we talk about cravings, but we don't actually crave these things most of the time. When we see coffee or candy, our brain remembers the caffeination, that sweet taste, the salty taste, whatever it might be, the sweet rush, and the reward is like, I remember that, I want that, and that's why we do it, that's why we eat. I ate a little thing of Swedish fish earlier because I'm like, ooh, 
I like that tart, salty, weird non nonsense that's going on in my mouth, and I want that, right? So a couple things that we might be familiar with. Next one, drinking. So drinking is always, this is not like a shameful discussion, but it's also a really good idea to be mindful with your drinking. If you are exploring sobriety or recovery, that's freaking amazing and it's difficult to do because you have to examine all these different things in your life that cause the behavior of you wanting to drink. And it could be a multitude of things. The routine or the behavior could be having a, a shift drink after work or going out to another bar after work or having a drink at home considering we're now in quarantine, right? The cue could be a long stressful day of work. If you're a nine to fiver, it could be that it's five o'clock. This is what we do at five o'clock. We go to a bar, we go to, we go to do this thing. So there's a multitude of different things that can happen depending on if you're a day walker, if you're a night walker, whatever it might be. The routine is the drink. The cue could be certain time of day, stress, uh, whatever it might be. But the reward is relaxation, de-stress, perhaps it's social engagement. It could be a lot of these different things. Um, but we can take into account all of those things um, because we can kind of shape shift all those things. So long as we know what the cue is and the reward is, we can change that behavior in the middle. Um, habits can't be eradicated. Our brain will cling on to it like with all desperation in this world. Um, it'll cling on to it at the exclusion of absolutely everything else. Our brain, again, is a sly, sly little devil that we know very, very little about, and it only uses like a small percentage of its capacity because it's capable of like world destruction, I'm pretty sure, right? Um, so we can change the habit while we understand our routines. We can keep the same cue and the same reward by exchanging out whatever the behavior is. Um, and once you're aware of habits, how your habits work, both the cue and the reward, you're like more than 50% there uh, in terms of being able to make that shift. Um, the biggest, one of the biggest things that people run into in terms of problems when they're doing these habit changes is that they will try to eliminate the behavior altogether, which just fails. So if anybody has ever seen uh, people who do like a dry January, something like that, what else happens in the process of you trying to do a dry January? you're missing that extreme amount of sugar and that craving. So you replace it with something else that is not necessarily a great behavior. So you have to proactively go in there to replace it. If I'm going to eliminate drinking, then I'm going to allow myself to do X, Y, Z to help out and compensate for that because your brain will automatically be like, I'm missing something. I need to put it back in my face immediately. Whether it's the interaction, whether it's the, some kind of like, food, liquid, whatever it might be. So trying to completely eradicate a behavior takes all of your willpower. Um, and it's, it's really difficult to do. So I always try to uh, discourage people from doing those temporary changes uh, unless they have an action plan to replace something else in there that's a positive behavior or a less negative behavior, whatever it might be. And then I don't want to talk about negative, positive in that kind of way because everybody's behaviors are different. Everything's on a spectrum. Um, it's really just a matter of like what's personal for you, what you actually feel inside, what you would like to change. So the way that we can do these things is by taking an inventory of the habits and behaviors that we do each day, right? So why do you take your dog on a walk? Alex, obviously, Julep needs to go outside, but the, the cue might be that it's the time of day. The cue might be that it is, uh, Julep needs to go to outside. The behavior is going on this long walk, and the reward is your dog's not going to do anything inside of your house. You get some one-on-one -on -one time with your animal, and you get some physical exercise. So there's lots of rewards to doing that. So that's an awesome positive behavior that you can continue to do. But did you even think about, like, what the actual cue was in the first place. Like, is it the time of the day? Is it that the dog needs to go out? Is this, is like, it's time for Alex to have some good headspace time? Like, not really, what we tend to forget or what we tend to overlook, no matter what the behavior is, is the actual cue. So what is it that makes me do this thing? Um, in the beginning of quarantine, it probably might still be happening for a lot of people, 
but did you find yourself getting up, going to your cabinets and looking for snacks and food? Were you actually hungry? Probably not. Are you bored? Are you worried? Are you anxiety ridden? Like there's a million different things. So like, and I, I go through this stuff all the time. Like I'll, I'll let something slide because I, I know that I can like, I know that I should know better like as the person who tries to teach people better habits. I'm like going up there and like, I can eat these Swedish fish, that's fine. And then I get up there and I keep eating Swedish fish. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Why are you doing this? Are you just bored? You're bored, go do something else. Go like, go do a squat, I don't know. That's, but that's me, like I'll go do squats. Some people might go read instead to, to cure that boredom. Some people might get some outside time for some vitamin D, all these different things. It's always that we're trying to like look past the cue in order to just fast forward to that reward. I want to not be bored anymore. I want to, I want to satiate my boredom. I want to not be stressed out. I want to just have a sweet day, right? Um, so we take a list and inventory of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Do we like what we're doing? Do we want to make a change? Cool if you do, cool if you don't. But that's the first step, lists. Love lists, lists are the awesome, most, most awesome thing. So we take a list of an inventory of the things that we do. We identify that routine. Is it snacking late at night? Is it excessive drinking? Is it going for walks? Is it working out? Like good, good behaviors, bad behaviors, anything in between. We isolate what the cues are. Are we bored? Are we depressed? Are we anxious? Oftentimes, that's exactly what it is. There's still a lot of times where like it is the actual time of the day that's like, I think this is what I do. For the very beginning of quarantine, after dinner was done, I was like, this is the time where I enjoy a nice scotch that I have in my house because it's nighttime and that's what I did. I was like, it's 10 o'clock. This is what I think I should be doing. Cut that out because it was like, it was a time trigger for me and I wasn't out and I wasn't socializing and that was my way of like trying to normalize what I was doing. Um, but what you can do then, so once you understand what the behavior is, you can backtrack to see what the cue is. And then you have the fun experimentation time of replacing and changing out and testing out different habits or behaviors that might properly fill that role, fill that gap. Um, is the reward social interaction? Cool, find a way to do that. Obviously we've got, we're like Zoom level expertise going on right now and this causes its own series of like fatigue in and of itself when you have to do only your interaction in this capacity, but can you find a way to safely social distance that will make you feel good, not make you feel unsafe, but will still give you that interaction that you need? Could you, delicate here, but like could you find a online group that you could interact with without a video, but obviously keeping yourself online and, and social media is, obviously has its own dangers in and of itself. But you can experiment and play with those behaviors in order to get yourself that same reward. Once you have, it's just a three-piece situation, but once you understand what your cues and your rewards are, then you have the fun time of being able to change out whatever the behavior is. Um, and have a plan. Like, so the SMART goals are a great way to attack some of those behavioral things if you want to. SMART goals don't have to be, I'm going to go write a novel. SMART goals could be like, I do want to make my lunch every day before I go into my shift. It's important for me because I get the satisfaction of not being hungry, eating a home cooked meal. It's good for me. And I don't have to spend additional money in a very strange time, right? There's, there's all these ways that we can kind of attack that situation. But having a plan, writing things down, listing an inventory of what you do on a regular basis um, is a great way to do it. If you're thinking about changing anything related to food, and that includes like if you have a nutritional need uh, where you have to get more of a specific vitamin in your world, you have a plan. You journal what you already eat on a day-to-day -day basis, you see where you have an opportunity to add in this particular vitamin deficiency that you might be having, or maybe you need to take dairy out of your world, right? Maybe dairy, because dairy impacts a lot of us differently, and the moment that you hit 30, a good portion of us turn into lactose intolerant people, and all of our cheese-loving affairs are crushed, and it's very sad. Um, but you make an inventory, you do a journaling of whatever's going on, so you can actually see what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, and then make a plan from that. Um, I love journaling. I also love um, the ability to set a goal the night before. 
So journaling can be one thing to do. And then another way to kind of keep evaluating your, um, your habits and your behaviors is to take five minutes before you go to bed, have a journal next to your, your bed, say what you want to do tomorrow. Small things. I want to get up. I want to make my bed. These are ways that you can set small, easy, achievable, regular behaviors that you can do each day. Um, the reason why those are so important is because if you, uh, so the other part of this, sorry, I get very excited about this journal. I'll show you what my journal is. So this is my little journal, of course, with a majestically awkward flamingo on it. Every night I take five minutes to write down what I want to do. What's the next day? What does that day look like? Because I can take a look at my calendar. Um, I set myself one or two goals of what I want to do. And if I'm feeling overly ambitious, maybe I throw another one in there. That's fine. You don't have to do that much. If you set one consistent goal, that's great. Um, I write down what roadblocks might get in my way. A lot of the time, one of the roadblocks is me. Like I get in my own way sometimes. So, but it could be that there is, if you have a lot of things on your Google calendar, one of your roadblocks could be that you have too many meetings back to back and it's gonna make you not be able to potentially achieve a goal that you wanna do. Uh, a roadblock could be if I want to make my lunch every day, well, I still need to go to the grocery store. Do I have time to do that? That way, when you can look at and prepare for those roadblocks, then you can get over top of them much, or get ahead of them much quicker. So whenever we're doing any kind of behavioral change, regardless of how small it is, there's always gonna be roadblocks. There's always gonna be hiccups. There's always gonna be things that get in the way of our progress. We have to understand and accept that so we can plan ahead for them. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's a difficult word to say because it's very big in health coaching, but it doesn't, it concerns me. So relapse is what we use within health coaching is that there's always gonna be a relapse to, a, to an old behavior. I don't really like that word because I think it takes away from people who are actively uh, seeking out recovery and sobriety because I think it takes away from their specific journey. So I call them roadblocks. There's always gonna be a hiccup. There's always gonna be a potential for a setback. Setbacks happen. So we have to accept that first and foremost and learn how to forgive ourselves so we can move forward. And if we can plan out all the particular roadblocks or setbacks or hiccups that we might be experiencing either on a day-to-day -day basis or something that can happen a month down the, the, uh, the road, then we can better prepare for it. And then the setback becomes so minuscule that it's that much easier for us to get over it. Right? This is my like, everybody is doing good. It's okay if you mess up. Messing up is cool. <laughs> Um, so this is an example of a food diary. If anybody's ever interested in like trying to change over something, like if you need to eliminate dairy or you need to get more leafy greens into your world, or you need to just change something about your eating behaviors. Like I don't believe in dieting. Uh, that's not the, the, the way in which I work with my, my coaching clients. Um, I believe in them being able to do what is right for their body, be healthy. Your body changes with food, with working out, with everything. So I really don't particularly believe in restricting anything because I think we need like what this machine needs to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. So food diaries, one thing. Um, the reason why we do that journaling the night before, making those small goals that we can achieve and we can keep adding them in each day. If it's making your bed, keep putting making your bed on there because the more that you achieve those those smaller goals, they're not so small in the end of the day. They are powerful. They are cumulative in the best possible way. They're enlightening and they have that butterfly effect. So it's a snowball kind of really positive thing that will happen. So we're making small steps and it's, this is why I need to get water. Tongue time. So you take small steps in a consistent direction focusing on the environmental and situational control of what you have in front of you. Um, this is like spoken like a true control freak type A person, but the more that you have control over that situation, the easier it is for you to like keep progressing forward and making positive steps uh, and not get frustrated by a setback. Um, it's a matter of like self-management and self-control, but not in that restrictive sense. So, one good habit seldom comes alone, right? One good habit seldom comes alone. Big changes equal small changes over time. 
Um, so that's where keystone habits come into play. They're more than just good habits. They are small yet powerful and have the potential to create a chain reaction of positive, positive effects. Um, similar to the butterfly effect, keystone habits are based on the idea that a single small habit can have a profound effect and change on something over time. Um, they lead to buy-ins of specific cultures, ideas, um, and lead to additional associative healthy habits. Um, so for example, a person who is trying to uh, increase the amount of steps they get in each day, right? So it's recommended that we get in 10,000 steps a day, and it's actually pretty hard to achieve, especially if you're quarantined or stuck inside, right? So in a normal world or in the before times, like I would suggest to that person that they park as far away in a parking lot wherever they're going. If they're going grocery shopping, then I want you to try to go to the back of the back of the parking lot. Why? Because it makes us walk a little bit further. We get a couple more steps in. Um, those few steps don't directly contribute to that person achieving their, their movement goals, uh, but then they become more aware of like, maybe I could take the steps instead of the elevator, or maybe I might start putting my clothes out to, for the next morning. So if I wanted to go, go for a walk, go to the gym, whatever it might be, then I have it already laid out and I'm prepared. Uh, it could be them starting to make their food the next day so they don't have to have something get in the way of them being able to achieve their step goal that they have, right? So there's all these little tiny things that start to happen uh, when, when we make those little baby keystone, keystone changes. Um, so this is, this is in terms of like a nutritional thing, uh, something I had when I was doing a nutrition class. Um, so if somebody's trying to make positive nutritional changes and it doesn't matter what it is, like we could just say they need to eliminate dairy from their diet, right? So the habit is I become increasingly aware of my current eating habits because I've journaled. I know that I'm eating this much dairy because cheese is delicious and I love it and it's, 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 <laughs> it's a hard thing to, to not have to have. So you start becoming increasingly aware of the other things that you're eating. Um, you might start to think about planning your dinners for the week once you see what you're eating, what you need to eliminate, what you need to add back in. Um, it could be that after you start planning those dinners for the week, if you have the opportunity to, you might sit down, eat, unplug, and share your day with other people. Again, this was something, this is a, <laughs> a card I created in the before time, so it was like when you could actually socialize with people on a regular basis. Um, but then you start to actually really enjoy your food, right? So we talked uh, in the beginning, we said something along the lines of like how um, complex the relationship is with food, with, uh, with nutrition, with wellness and, and all of it. But like maybe this leads to because we're, we're eliminating dairy. So we're paying attention to what else we're eating. Eliminating that dairy is making our body feel better. So we get really excited and maybe we start planning out other things to eat and, and we want to tell people about it. And then when we're not feeling like icky because like maybe that dairy is no longer upsetting your stomach and your brain, like when you have an upset stomach, it upsets your brain. The gut and the, and the brain are very closely tied. Um, when you're not hurting all the time, then you start to enjoy your food. And this is kind of a long shot, but if like you're a person that, that is smoking, like maybe I'm like, oh, I feel really good. Maybe I'll stop, maybe I'll think about stopping smoking right? So there's all these different things that can happen. It's just small little bits that start to pile on and make positive changes in the long run. So small change equals big change over time. Um, for all these things too, like making the positive change has a positive effect on your self-esteem. Positive self-esteem means that I want to continue doing good things for myself because I'm really high on this feeling of like, I feel good about myself, my actions, my choices, and what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So it's all really, really tied together. Um, I feel like that might be it, because I, I know I wanted to, like, just give an opportunity. I'm going to stop sharing. Give an opportunity for people to ask all the questions. There we go. Stop sharing. Um, so I know that's a lot. Does anybody have questions about like how habit loops work or like, are you able to look at the list you previously wrote down for yourself and see if there's other things you want to add action steps that you want to take to make a, a cool change in your life? Um, thoughts, feelings, otherwise. 
Uh, yeah. So um, I thought it was really interesting the, the replacing the routine but keeping the cue and the reward. Mm -hmm. My challenge, I think, with that is uh, so a lot of the times the uh, the reward or so like the routine that I'm trying to break because it might be a, like a bad habit. So for me, it's usually like I wake up in the morning and the first thing I do is I, I get coffee and then I sit down and I play like some video games, right? But that kind of sets the tone for the day of where I'm, I feel less productive and I want to try to replace that, right? So the cue is like waking up in the morning and my... Um, my time to like spend doing something relaxing, you know, mm -hmm. um, but oftentimes I find that the thing that I'm trying to replace it with, like I've tried replacing it with like working out in the morning. I've tried to replace it with um, different activities that I'm, that give me a reward, but they don't seem to give me the same thing. So it doesn't feel as beneficial and it doesn't feel as I'm not as driven to continue to replace that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, what I'm hearing is actually two behaviors. So you have both the coffee and the video games. Yeah, I'm not trying to change the coffee though. <laughs> fine, totally fine, right? So behavior number one, you have the coffee. I wake up, I'm sleepy, I have coffee, I'm perky. Satisfaction, there we go. What does the gaming provide for you? Um, it's kind of a, it's a zone out, you know, it's a not thinking about things. It's removing like my mental thought process from whatever else is going on in my life and just dealing with that. So you do get satisfaction and re relaxation from playing the games. Oh. What's the actual cue then? Is it that you're done drinking coffee or it's, is the cue that you are anxious about the day's workload? Yeah, that might be. I, so I guess that's true that more than likely the cue is not just wait, not just the part of waking up, you know, not just the part of like, it's my morning time and like sitting down. And because usually the the two habits coincide with each other, right? Like, mm -hmm. and then also drinking coffee. Um, but the, uh, yeah, the interesting that it's not necessarily, the waking up isn't maybe not necessarily the cue. It's more about the, the mental things that are going on that is, that is causing me to be like, okay, like this is why I want to disconnect, you know? Kurt, um, would it be within like your scope of the day? Could you put that behavior of playing video games somewhere at the end as the reward for getting through your day? Yeah, I mean, I've got nothing else going on. So, so it's about experimentation, right? So experiment with taking that behavior somewhere else because there is still a good, the cue is stress, the reward is zoning out, which we all deserve to be able to do that. So you can keep that behavior, you can try putting it into a different part of the day, and then in that initial post-coffee um, stress slash anticipation for the day, maybe for the temporary, you experiment playing out that routine and maybe it's like five minutes of meditation that says like, I'm fucking awesome. I'm going to have a great day. No matter what these people bring to me, I'm going to kill it. Like try some positive reinforcement for yourself or, you know, again, this is where you get to play. You don't have to get rid of the video games if they're not disruptive to the point of like, you're not getting your work done the sure. same way as a, as someone who drinks won't stop drinking until they have, harmed some portion of their work and maybe even then will not necessarily change. So if it's, if it's not a harmful behavior because it's, it is video gaming, it's a, it's a opportunity to be social and to get out of, get out of your headspace, change it to be a reward for doing an awesome job during the day. Sure. Yeah. And then figure out something, play with a different behavior, that will help you gear up for the rest of the day because you're you're expressing that there's stress and anxiety for what's about to happen for the day. So you need some kind of hand, uh, psych up for yourself mm -hmm. rather than zoning out. So zoning out gets you unprepared for the rest of the day, but tuning in will. Sure. So that helps. And we can like, just text me afterwards. We can go through some different ideas. Let me know, like list out some things that you would like to replace. List out some things that would be a good test for you. 
even if it's like five minutes of working out. Yeah. And it could be a routine of like, I'm gonna do 10 mount climbers, 10 push-ups. Actually not these things since your shoulders jacked up right now, but like find some, list out some experimental things that you would like to try. Plan tonight to start them tomorrow or plan tomorrow to start them on Friday or start them next week. We always also have like a better, um, our brains attach ourselves to a start date very well. So whether you whether you are okay with saying like August 27th, sorry, I was looking at my watch to see what the date was. I was like, if starting August 27th is going to help you with the hard deadline, that's fine. Or it can be starting on Sunday, starting on Monday. That's why everybody makes New Year's resolutions as well, which aren't, are never a bad thing. They also just try to go all in on something that they haven't made an action plan for. Yeah, makes sense. So, no, that's all great advice. Thank you. Experimentation. Uh, Chandler, you had hand raise. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. So um, what if, because I know you talked about like replacing the behavior and keeping the cue and the reward, but what if I'm aware enough to realize that the reward is detrimental? How can I train myself to want a different reward? If I'm having this behavior... Um, for example, let's take like the video games, right? So if I'm having this uh, behavior that I then reward myself with video games, but I reward over reward myself perhaps to where that's all I do and other things are falling by the wayside, but all of my behaviors continue to just allow me to become distracted, which is the reward that I want for myself. How can I train myself to not do that? So if I'm hearing correctly, you're saying the I'm going to kind of go with the reward is distraction and you're like getting way too much of that distraction. Mm -hmm. um, distraction is okay as reward. We need something to like put our heads in different spaces. Um, so I don't think you should look at it in a negative perspective of that because we do need it. Same thing with like the cue of, of stress and anxiety. Um, is always going to be there. So it's how do we manage it instead? So there could be a lot of different things. What have you ever experimented with changing the amount of time that you spend doing the behavior, keeping the behavior, if it's not harmful to yourself, but if the distraction could be cut down in the amount of time to make it less severe, have you experimented with changing the amount of time that you have dedicated um, to it? Um, yes and no. I find that though, like I'm a person that like I set these goals, I accomplish them and then I reward myself. And then like, if I'm rewarding myself, once I hit reward, I have no self-control because everything's done. So then I overindulge, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, and I think that still goes back to what the behavior is. So can you change the behavior that elicits that reward? So what can you experiment out with? If, if it's, I mean, are you talking about is it video gaming? Is it, is it, is it drinking? And then like I drink and then I have too much or is it, is it a detrimental behavior? I believe so. Yes. Okay. So what could it be replaced with? That That's what I'm, that I think that's the question I'm getting at. Cause like, I feel like I'm rewarding myself with something easy and mm -hmm. allowing myself to become complacent with it. And then it becomes detrimental because that's my go-to all the time. And it, because I overindulge, then there's less time for other things. It ends up eating into the other time. So I'm wondering, how do I motivate myself to find a different kind of reward? Well, I mean, start by writing down the feelings that you're talking about right now. This is something that we can either talk about privately somewhere else. But right now, list out what happens when you receive the reward, receive the distraction, who is it impacting? Is it impacting you? Is it impacting your interpersonal relationships? So write out those things. Journaling is a really great way for us to be cognizant of what's going on. Um, without writing it down, we it, it's almost this wonderful, weird thing of like, it's not actually happening. If I don't document it, it's not actually a problem. Gotcha. So by starting to list out exactly what's going on, so you understand what that still go with the behavior, tell me what the distraction, the reward is, whatever it is, list that out so you can be cognizant of it and then start to hold yourself accountable. In terms of replacing the behavior, it's absolutely possible to do that, but I like I will never tell a person what to replace 
that behavior with. That is something that has to come from within because the there's intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic comes from within. It's something that I want to change because it's gonna personally affect me in this way. Extrinsic means that there's uh, outside influences. Either you're trying to make me happy or your partner happy or someone in this room happy or you're trying to get like an outwardly appearance change, whatever it might be. It comes from not within. And what is within you is far more powerful than what I or anybody else could say or ask of you to do. So this is where same thing like telling Kevin, like write out, so journal number one, here's the way I'm, when I do this, it makes me feel like this. So use your I statements the same way. When I do this, it makes me feel like this. That will help you start to identify really a little bit more intricacies of what the cue is, what the behavior is, and what that reward is turning into. And then from there, you can kind of back that up into seeing what might replace that behavior without uh, turning it into such a, a um, I don't want to say self-indulgent because if it, like I, I don't know what we're talking about and I'm trying to be delicate about it, but like self-care is also really good. So if you're doing something to make yourself feel good, I do believe in being able to do that. If you're doing something that's harming yourself, that's when we need to reevaluate what's going on. But you have you have room to experiment within the resources that you have. Um, so again, if, like I, I, I can't give you the answer because it's got to come from you. If I tell you, then like, then you feel like you're accountable to me, and that's a that's a horrible thing to have. Like yeah. you don't want to be accountable. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but let's let's talk about it offline too. Like start start journaling that stuff out. Think about making some lists and think about really starting to dissect that behavior and see where we can go with it in a different direction. Yeah, Keith, you said you had the same thing. Yeah, very similar to that. I would say, yeah, like just overindulging in my rewards and putting other things to the wayside and just kind of not doing things I should be doing instead. Yeah, um, that's super common for all of us. I want everybody to try to be a little bit more forgiving of yourselves because it's okay to, it's okay to not do everything the right way a thousand percent of the time and who's to judge what the right thing is the moment that your safety starts coming into question um your safety and your livelihood that's when you need to start reevaluating things um be gentle with yourself and know that it's okay to not be a hundred percent awesome at all times um be forgiving of yourself but start to look at like what is leading to that self-indulgent or overindulgent behavior in the first place? What's that cue? Can, can you kind of like tame that cue as well? Can you tame what the trigger is that's causing you to do it? Is there a way to, sorry, go ahead. I, I think for me, mine's probably linked with like, well, I don't know, I, I guess anxiety and depression definitely have a big role in it for where it's escapism. So kind of like with the video game thing, it's like a, it's like a zone out kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah hard to hard to find that motivation to change too when you're in that that bad space too um so yeah i guess i don't know how to do that i'm working with my counselor now about changing habits and uh um accountability and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but yeah this ties in pretty closely i think yeah it absolutely does <laughs> yeah boredom boredom is a huge one uh LG. um but so number one you're just starting your experience with counseling Right now, and I know that I know a lot of people in here a little bit more personally than others. So, like, I know you're just starting your your journey. So, it is a journey. It's not like a race. It is something we do step by step as we're going through. Again, trying to give yourself as much love and forgiveness along the way. Um, and when managing that stress, that anxiety, that depression, you can still have your zone out time. You can still have that behavior. But think about if there's a different time of the day where that behavior could go. Uh, as a way to manage it, is there a shortened time, like an alarm that you can put on for yourself, like I must stop this thing. Um, think about, I mean, you, you have room to play. If we think about it more in like a childlike manner that we are able to play with these, these things that we're doing to find joy in a different capacity, um, it becomes a little bit nicer to, 
to 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 work on those things like not not a task not a a chore um we think about like what i can really get out of this um and if you are a person uh a lot of people are very good with like when you start writing stuff down you hold yourself accountable you are the only person you have to be accountable for and your glorious dog zelda so <laughs> but like you are responsible for you. You're not responsible for anybody else. How is a way that you can be responsible to yourself and provide yourself with the things that you need? Safely, happily, whatever. Doesn't mean you have to eliminate things from your life. It's a matter of how can we shape shift it either to a different time of day, a different limited time, uh, subbing it out somewhere else. Like it's, it's, I hate to say it's like plug and chug, but like you could plug and chug that behavior somewhere else. Um, and if it's something that, if it is a behavior that absolutely has to be eliminated because it's detrimental to your health and your well being, then that's where you go from somewhere beyond me and you go to a professional human being that can help you, whether it's, you know, a psychologist, a dietitian, a, a, a doctor, a whatever it might be, a, a counselor you know, addiction person. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like I start as like the spider web of people that I can like branch you off to, but start thinking like at the end of the day, I don't want to keep anybody too much, too much longer. Um, it is a matter of just starting to become more self-aware of what's going on in your world. Journaling sounds like such a goofy thing, but writing down things, anything that's going on, any thoughts that are in your brain, help you to start categorizing what's going on in your world and just becoming a little bit more aware of it. We're not able to actually make any kind of changes if we don't have awareness of our situation, of ourselves, if we're not mindful of what's going on. Um, so like everybody in here, be more gentle with yourself because this is like a group that, <laughs> everybody in this group seems like they are like to beat themselves up when, when something doesn't go right. Um, or when you feel like you have done something not, not good. Like we just have to be into the process, into the journey and know that everything takes time, experimentation and it will happen. We just got to stay dedicated. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is great advice. I appreciate you. That's awesome. All right, France. Well, if anybody doesn't have anything else, I know we're, we're after 12 o'clock, so um please if anybody ever wants to contact me otherwise to talk more about this stuff um i'll put it in the chat right now but you can always get me on instagram uh and i will oh i'm in all caps right now you can always um reach out to me there you can always email me uh if you're a texter that's always that's my number feel free to always text me i get anxiety about phone calls we're all special it's fine uh, <laughs> but I'm always here to help and provide guidance and more resources. Um, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Focus on Health. And I know Laura is not here, but thank you, um, Seed Lift. This has been awesome. Thank you for like uh, letting me be able to talk to you about habits because I think it's it's important. It's, it's something we all all need to be able to talk about and be comfortable with. Thank you. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Seed Lift, so much for the support this week. Uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.